Yeah, it's a it's a great pleasure to be uh, in in the presence of all of you guys because you're going to be movers and shakers of the industry one day. Copywriting is an is a skill of influence, and some of you already are. Uh, copywriting is a skill of influence. It's also a skill of the mind. Uh, without being able to adjust what's going on inside the mind, you don't have flexible copy. You won't be able to match and pace the audience effectively in order for them to make the purchase. And we all know that without making the purchase, there are downstream consequences. Businesses go out of business. Uh, people who are supposed to be happy aren't served happiness. Uh, people who need some needs fulfilled don't get that fulfilled. So it's important to put all of that in context. Now, first and foremost, uh, some of you may be also wondering a little bit more deeply into my background. I've been a consultant for the last 28 years, spoken to probably well over half a million people. And um, I never thought much about that number until I started counting um, what it really meant to have impacted. Uh, actually, I've, I stopped counting once I came to the uh, rough estimate of half a million, probably more than that. So once I, I came to an end of, uh, of trying to keep count, which is a little bit difficult in uh, digital days, come to realize that uh, there must have been something that, that drove me right, uh, to, to be able to do all of this. And all I can say is that um, I'm, not a, I'm not particularly interested, even though in my previous business, we did like a 12 million by the time I left that business. Um, it, it wasn't about the money. Um, in fact, I still hardly even uh, pay attention to my bank accounts. What really is important to me is the nature of impact, the nature of uh, ensuring individuals get what they need, and uh, the process of healing. Now, I know that might be odd to hear from someone who's sometimes known as the godfather of internet marketing in Singapore. Um, I, I, I guess uh, being involved in the scene of internet marketing back in 2006, 2007, kind of like put me at the right place at the right time. Uh, but I was quite sick and tired of, uh, you know, being involved in places where people didn't appreciate what was being done. There's a lot of effort being put in. And I'm pretty sure some of you understand that feeling too. What is it like to really put up, put yourself uh, on the line and, and try to um, get results for somebody else? So it takes a huge amount of clarity and a desire to want to do something that's meaningful and purposeful for you, isn't it? So without that meaning and purpose, I mean, anybody could ask you to do a, a sales copy for, I don't know, a, a can of soda, um, a, a computer, but those might not necessarily be your, your raison d'etre, right? Why do you exist? So this journey that, that I'm going to bring you uh, down is probably going to help you to take a look at not just yourself, but also to, through the eyes of uh, maybe an observer, take a look at uh, maybe someone might be uh, fortunate enough to, to want to, to play this game of uh, volunteering and seeing whether we can generate some clarity here. Uh, because this multi-layer, I, I, I've helped top executives in, in uh, chief executive offices in large organizations, in small organizations, and it amounts to the same thing the human condition. We're all human. So we encounter weaknesses. We encounter difficulties. We encounter challenges with courage. We encounter difficulty with clarity. We call it uh, maybe uh, imposter syndrome or something by some other name, whatever you might call it. It stymies you. It gives you a block and it prevents you from being able to move forward in the directions that you are deserving of. So the, the, the core of your very being, the sense that you're not good enough, the sense that um, there's a lot of anxiety, you're not sure where your next paycheck's going to come from, you're not necessarily clear where the world is headed, especially post-COVID, things seem to be hunky-dory, but is that really the case, right? So everybody has their own uh, stresses, their own pressures. Today, this is my eighth call today, since 4 a.m. So, uh, one of the things that I, I don't like to pretend to, to have is boundless energy. Uh, the good news is that sometimes uh, uh, you, you, you can have a nice, quick and simple meal to just <laughs> recharge the energy, right? And that's what I just did, you know, spent about 15 minutes. Um, the uh, delivery guy came a little bit late, but it was okay. At the end of the day, there are a lot of things that we can be grateful for. But let's come back to this human story of ours. 
uh, by starting off with my journey. I, I began in internet marketing by observing certain speakers in the industry. This was way back in 2005 when I was just starting to hear about a guy called Corey Rudell. Those of you who know Corey Rudell or you've heard of him before, could you type in yes in chat? Type in yes in chat. Yeah, yeah. So those of you who are from that era, you, you understand uh, how he actually brought internet marketing in a nice package into the hands of people all around the world. And that's fantastic. Without him, without his legacy, um, and of course, we know that he passed on a little bit later than that, but he passed on. And without that little manual on internet marketing secrets, I would never have thought about getting into internet marketing, let alone understand what the entire big deal was at that point of time. So uh, at that point of time, we were running seminars, workshops, uh, personal mastery events, transformative events uh, together with my previous partners. And uh, it, it was a nice ride. People started to get transformed, but transformation is just the beginning of the journey, right? So we have this uh, uphill battle with fate. Then we come crashing down and then transformation takes place not at the peak of the mountain, but in the depths of the darkest valleys that you encounter. So if you happen to be, uh, you know, uh, Knights of the Holy Grail, then you know very well that you are battling evil in all its forms, right? And one of the things that we need to get clear on is what you're fighting for. A lot of people are not clear what they're fighting for. A lot of people are not sure what their purpose is. So one of the things that I've been blessed with is a tragic life. <laughs> so uh, why, why I call it tragic is because um, somehow or other, every client that I meet, I'm a psychotherapist, don't hold that against me. I'm a psychotherapist, I'm an executive coach, uh, organizational psychologist. People come to me have been <laughs> the people uh, were, were, are in the image of a version of me in the past. All right? So for example, I've had situations where uh, divorcees out of the blue appear in front of me and start saying, oh, I've got low energy. I don't know why. Turns out it's because they haven't let go of something in their marriage. Uh, guess what? <laughs> I happen to be quite experienced in that. Uh, some other people, they've got a terrible bankroll, can't raise money, can't raise funds, um, end up in a ditch. They think that they're depressed and just turned out that these two young gentlemen recently, I won't say recently, it's about four months ago, uh, came and approached me and I know how it feels like to have like one and a half months of your total expenses left in your bank. And they took that amount and they paid me and they don't have a small team, by the way, they have a team of 20 people and they paid me and right now, uh, the, the problem was they didn't know how to generate leads. Now they have no problem with leads. In fact, they have a problem with leads in the opposite direction, too many leads. Uh, I, I don't say that to tell you how great I am. I tell you that because there's a lot of people who, who need you because you have overcome a version of yourself of the past. So one of the things I teach about marketing resonance and market resonance is you're always selling to some version of you in the past because you understand the pains very well, you understand the language that they're using, you understand the mindset, the emotional, the visceral sensations that are going on inside a person's uh, body. And as a result of that, you know that you are in that market when people that you see facing problems uh, are the, 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 the people whom remind you of a version of you of the past. And therefore, the journey, your, your purpose or your journey is very well uh, uh, a trend line of tragedies. So when have you fallen? When have you fallen flat on your face and found it difficult to wake, uh, get up? Right? Uh, sometimes it's even a challenge for some people to wake up, let alone get up from a tragedy. So if you've lost somebody before, uh, I lost my dad, uh, just thankfully just prior to COVID, otherwise it would have been quite terrible. Um, to cancer. Uh, it doesn't, uh, probably wouldn't surprise you that that set me on a journey on health, nutrition. Not that I'm a freak for, for the best foods only, but it gave me a very stark reminder of what it means to lose somebody and realize that you don't want to lose yourself. And I think it's important for, for any one of us as copywriters entering into the mind of the individual. Uh, as an NLP practitioner, by the way, that that's not an 
natural language processing, in case any of you are wondering, so neuro-linguistic programming. And what that means to me, uh, after being trained by the co-founder, Dr. Richard Bandler, um, I came to realize that life was not just about all the bad stuff and the negative stuff. A lot of it has got to do with us not being able to see uh, the context in which we're in. So one of the uh, things that I sometimes do is I ask people this question, right? On this whiteboard, if let's say I were to just simply uh, draw this, right? It's, a, it's just a black circle in the middle of a white canvas. So the question is, how many percent of this blackness do we actually see um, out of the entire screen? And for most of us, we'll say, oh, maybe it's a 1%, thereabouts, right? Probably wouldn't, uh, might even be less than 1%. But if you understand this concept, what typically happens to most people is that we take this black dot and we amplify it by zooming into it, thereby causing us to think that the entire world is just black. Uh, that singular toxic experience that you had with uh, an ex-boyfriend or an ex-client or, or your boss started to mistreat you or whatever it might be, right? Something tragic. Uh, the world is still a beautiful place to be in, right? There's 99% of what it is that we're not looking at that sometimes we don't uh, take a look at and be grateful for. I would say not even great gratitude um, describes that experience. Sometimes it's about the sense of awe, right? To be able to look out at the windows and take a look at the, the sun rising and go like, wow, that's a beautiful sight. And I think many of us have forgotten uh, where we've come from. So what I'd like all of us to sort of like uh, take into consideration, uh, because I've kind of identified myself as a healer rather than as a marketer or as a business owner, or as a uh, copywriter or whatever, I, I look at myself as a healer. Why do I say that? Um, how many of you are familiar with the concept of coming full circle? If you do, just type in one in chat. If you don't, type in two in chat. The concept of coming full circle. Okay. <laughs> Shanae has come full circle in a zero, uh, which is kind of interesting. Uh, so, yeah. So some of you understand coming full circle. For example, you were poor, you battled poverty, and then you became rich and you realized that you overcame poverty and you look at poverty very differently from the average person who made a million bucks selling, let's say, NFTs when they were a billionaire son, for example, right? Um, you came full circle when you were born into ill health, asthma, broken legs, whatever. And then you grew to be this massive athlete, right? Very intense in your training and so on. Uh, you grew to a full circle experience when all of your relationships were all vindictive and victimizing of you. Uh, and then you met the love of your life who treated you like a god or a goddess. And then life completely changed. You no longer saw those people anymore. You saw them as just a pathway towards your progress. And that's a beautiful thing. Uh, a, a lot of us don't see that. And might I suggest that copy is something like that. Copy is about healing the rift between the buyer and the buyer's intentions together with the seller and the seller's intentions. Without being able to heal or bridge that rift, we will not be able to help them to experience a different part of life. So uh, in, in most of my work, I tend to talk about uh, how individuals tend to be fractured. So if any of you have heard of the concept known as kintsugi, kintsugi is a Japanese art of putting pottery back together, utilizing gold lacquer. So they melt down the gold and then they use the gold lacquer to fuse the broken pieces of china, porcelain, whatever it might be, together so that uh, while it was valuable in the past, the, the, the ancient vase or vase, depending on, your, on how you pronounce it, uh, you take that and you infuse all the shattered pieces with, with gold and these linings appear to be even more artistic, even more beautiful than before. Uh, and hence the idea of a person being fractured being able to be put together again, um, to me, represents a very important art of learning about our own healing, our own journey. So clarity happens when you are complete, when you've come either in a full circle experience and you should be hunting for some of these because the tendency for most people is to chase after full circle experiences. Um, in other words, I am poor in relationships. Therefore, I hunt for amazing relationships. 
uh, I'm terrible in communication. I become a Toastmaster and try to win over a, a world stage, which incidentally was partly my story as well. Uh, as an introvert being bullied in school who didn't really have very many friends to count on one hand, um, it was quite an experience to, to have to realize how lonely some people are, especially entrepreneurs. And they really don't have very much support out there. In fact, probably their, their mother said something like, oh, you know, this, this new hobby of yours is probably not going to lead down any uh, interesting path, let alone to riches, right? So uh, many people have had that experience and I truly empathize with them. And sometimes as a result of that, uh, they come to me and have conversations to get clarity in terms of where they need to go. When the veil is lifted from you, you start to see all the possibilities because we were born as children to live in curiosity. And curiosity helps you to develop a sense of clarity. The sense of coming to a full circle is sort of like a movement towards clarity. Uh, the, the fight between yourself and your alter egos, right? Uh, the nastiest versions of yourself that you don't like to see even in the mirror, those are the things that you're attempting to fight. And sometimes that gives you some clarity. What do I mean? Uh, not all the time does clarity come from just seeing. Okay. A lot of us try to look at visual clarity. You know, it's nice to have uh, your screen very, very crisp, very, very clear on a 4K screen, right? It's very nice, pleasing to the eyes. But sometimes the truths that are out there in the world, the way you look at things, they can't be seen. Friendship sometimes cannot be seen. They can only, they can only be felt. Uh, the resonance toward a product sometimes is done visually, right? But it goes beyond just the words, don't you think? Sometimes it's the inferences, the, the invisible that pulls the heartstrings, that enables people to say, yes, this is something that I full wholeheartedly want to get myself involved with. So over time, I've come to realize this prospect of clarity can only happen when I am complete in some shape or form or other. If I'm totally de-energized and tired, and there can be a million and one reasons why you don't have energy. If you tackle just energy alone, you'll end up with answers such as alcohol, drugs, whatever, right? Caffeine, extra caffeine, as if it, it's uh, a, a drug and it becomes sometimes an affliction. But when you deal with the root cause of what created this loss of energy, you have a little bit of clarity about what to solve in the first place. So people with low energy, uh, could have come from a very embattled family environment, right? Many people are struggling in their own right uh, and you don't see it during the day, but back home when they go back after, after office hours, they start experiencing maybe the worst abuse, right? Uh, that lowers the energy. And then the boss is saying like, oh, you, you don't know how to get this work done properly, which is again, an unfair judgment, don't you think? So through the course of experiencing trauma, difficulty, uh, you hunt down rather than avoid the trauma. So one of the first things that you might want to consider is this. Uh, if you've ever had a bad experience or a creeping sense of negative energy in you or, or bad emotions, and there's this nagging thought. Maybe it's anxiety knocking at your door. Maybe it's fear that's uh, gripping you at your heart. Um, one of the first things that most human beings do is they try to aspirin it out of the way, right? So those of you who don't have aspirin in, in your country, uh, like in Southeast Asia, we have this thing called Panadol. Um, so you tend to take those things and you Panadol the headache away. The Panadol functions as a symptomatic cure. In which case, you end up taking more and more Panadol because whenever you go back to that environment, you are going to encounter the same kinds of headaches again, right? So what happens is that Panadol is really good at taking a moving pain and be making it become a morning pain so that you just complain about the headache and you just stay the same. Interestingly enough, what if I were to tell you that facing the pain, facing that fear, facing that anxiety is the number one thing that we have to do? So I saw on YouTube, this is really hilarious video. Uh, it's about a man and a woman. They're, they're talking about stuff. And this husband, well, I would assume it's the husband, he's sitting down and trying to listen to the, uh, the wife go on. And the wife, unknown to her, I suppose, has an arrow through her head. 
or, or a nail through the head, something along those lines. And she's bleeding, right? And she's going like, you know, darling, I had a bad day. You know, it's terrible. I don't know why, but this massive headache just built up inside of me. And it was terrible. Everyone I tried to speak to, even the closest people that I want to embrace, just gave me more of headache. And the, the husband is looking at her and going like, um, um, you have a nail in your head. And she goes like, that's not the point. You're not listening to me. You got to listen to my emotions, man. Right? And this is hilarious because at that point of time, your blind spots just cannot be seen. Right? It's a, it's, it was a hilarious, a fascinating uh, conversation to highlight the fact that to a great extent, we don't even listen to ourselves. We failed to even be our... Uh, well, I'll, I'll give you an example right now. Uh, recently, I had an uh, a, an interesting encounter with an executive uh, coaching experience with a leader, a senior leader in a large multinational corporation, and um, he he didn't seem to think that he was the cause of his problems. He was playing the victim most of the time. He was saying, "Oh, my son's not studying. He's going to get himself into trouble. You know, I make him study, but he just doesn't want to do it." And it didn't uh, seem like he knew that the manner by which he was saying it was the cause. Because in his mind, his dad used to treat him like that and was okay. You know, he turned out successful nonetheless. But he wasn't aware, let alone clear about uh, the, the cause of that frustration or that, that conflict. So one of the things that I realized was his, the problem behind his anger. Now, a typical psychologist or psychiatrist might probably send him for some anger management program, something along those lines, right? But the reason for his anger was not anger itself. That was the symptom. And we were not listening to the anger. So I told him, Mr. So-and-so, could you just, I notice you're getting really frustrated and irate right now. So could you take a seat? I'd like you to notice that seething anger inside of you and trace it inside your body. So first step, for clarity, somatic embodiment. Right? We call that embodiment. So you trace your body, you can get a sense of where you're feeling it inside your body. And this man said, I feel it in my hands, like, like my fist, he said. I said, okay, cool. Um, if it had a voice, what would it be saying? And you know, for, for all intents and purposes, probably doesn't have a voice. But if it did have a voice, what would it say? And he said, I feel like punching something. I said, cool. You feel like punching something? Tell me when was the first time you ever encountered that? The first time in your life where you ever encountered that? And that brought him back on a journey because emotions tend to be strung like pearls across life. Uh, if you encounter anger or frustration or addiction or any other sense of trauma today, it's not because of what had just happened to, to you and your, your wife or you and your spouse uh, or, or, or you and the cat or dog. It, it wasn't that specific moment just five minutes ago. It was something that happened way back there. I'm not saying that all things happen like that, but most of the time, emotional connections take place like that. So it was so easy because we embodied the sensation inside the body and we allowed the body to speak. We allowed the anger to speak. And the anger basically said, I feel like punching somebody. And that represents the, the, the circle that has not been closed, the loop that has not been closed, that the unconscious mind has been seeking all its life. So when he goes back to age five years old and he remembers grandpa laying it on him, uh, it brings back a certain memory and he goes like, oh my God, I'm doing exactly the same thing. I'm propagating the same trauma <laughs> to my own son. And all of a sudden, he got extremely guilty. He felt really guilty. Now, what happens now? With guilt, we do the same thing. He said, oh man, I've been, I've been so terrible as a father. Uh, I should have paid closer attention to him. I shouldn't have done all these things to him. I said, okay, cool. Just hang on. What you're feeling now is guilt, right? He said, yeah, I feel really guilty, regretful. I said, bring that feeling into your body. And if that body part had a voice, what would it say? He said, I shouldn't be treating my son this way. Okay, for what purpose do you say that? Oh, because um, I should 
own up to responsibility. I should be supporting and protecting him. So, okay, so I'm hearing some of these other higher order goals other than just getting angry at him. So we're getting somewhere. We're getting to a higher level of intent. And I think for most of us, we, we, ha- we treat this very unconsciously. And for some strange reason, I, I was visualizing the relationship between father and son because he told me a little bit about the history. And I said, am I not right that your son gets angry because he's actually guilty? And I'm, I'm just saying that because by extrapolation, if father has been role modeling all of this through his son's life, his son's probably going to have that too, right? And he slaps his forehead right in front of me at that point of time. He goes like, of course, he's guilty all the time. He, he thinks that he's not good enough and he doesn't live up to our expectations. And then things begin to unravel. And then things begin to get clear in terms of that relationship, that connection between father and son. So it turns out after a few months, uh, I, I follow up with him and he says this. He says, uh, things are, are much, much better. Of course, there could be things that, uh, that, that I can continue to do, but I would, uh, I would say that we wouldn't even be able to sit down and have a proper meal if not because of your intervention. So I say this, again, not to brag about it, but to let you know that sometimes healing begets clarity, right? So whenever you're, you're angry, upset by something, feeling a sense of shame, guilt, whatever it might be, sometimes it's necessary for you to take a seat, close your eyes, embody the feeling, and let that child, whether it's uh, shame or embarrassment or whatever negative feeling that you might be feeling, that you've always been saying, shut up, it's not your turn to speak. Let it speak. Hold the space. It's a sacred space for it to share its intention for one thing to approach you. Because most of the time, such feelings are not necessarily the best to enact actions. So think about anxiety. What have you done whenever you are anxious? Nothing really good, right? What happens when you're angry at something or some situation? You don't perform at your best. So a lot of the time, when we are embodying negative emotions like that, they're not meant to be acted on. But some of us either try to do a timeout and move away from uh, trying to nurture or to experience this feeling, which in my analogy is like trying to cut off your left arm simply because uh, it's weaker than your right arm, right? Uh, if, if any one of us has been uh, working out using our right arm only, of course, it'll be strong. But it also means that the reason why there's weakness is because the left arm hasn't been trained. So uh, in taking a look at what we do as a healing process, we start to ask the question, have I been silencing parts of me so that it has no choice but to scream in order to get my attention? Have I been ignoring parts of me that I have to scream in order for my parent to get their attention? And if you recognize this, it must mean that the cycles either get expanded on. That means if you were angry a little bit when you were a child, you ended up becoming more and more angry over the years until it came to a breaking point, right? Or uh, uh, if you were anxious and you were initially uh, frightened, later on the anxiety kind of like turned into some kind of a full-blown disaster later on. So cycles either grow or they diminish. In which direction are you in? Yeah. So, so I, I, I th- sometimes sit down and talk to, to individuals and I tend to get them some clarity because there's something in their way. There is an invisible barrier that's stopping them. And the only way to get access to that is through the body. To understand how the body really re- relates to it. Uh, sometimes even movement like, like this. I mean, if you, if you did a gesture like this, Right. This kind of a gesture is not a gesture of depression or sadness, right? This might be, you know, uh, oh, what the heck, right? So you can actually ascribe a certain voice or a certain phrase to certain kinds of gestures and actions. And this I learned from Fritz Perls a uh, long, long time ago. I was uh, as a student in, uh, strangely enough, in linguistics class, I was studying psychotherapeutic discourse because the university did not allow me 
to take on my honors year in psychology because I didn't meet the grade, whatever that might mean. So I ended up studying linguistics. And I said, you know, I had I was adamant on, on following my own path because I was so curious about psychotherapeutic discourse. I studied uh, Fritz Perls, and he did something truly ahead of his time. He would look at a client who's, you know, sitting cross-legged and she's kind of like moving her feet like that. And would call that out and say, you're doing something with your feet. Do that some more. Do that some more. And I remember that very, very vividly. It's like, um, he wasn't asking why she did it. He was asking her to do it some more in order for the body to speak. In other words, to hold the space for any kind of communication that's present. And that got massive clarity. I mean, compared with two other psychotherapeutic approaches that were being compared on the same client at the same time, that was massive. And it, it kind of like inspired me to start looking at the power of language in bridging people's perspectives. You know how it is, right? If, if you are standing uh, on one side of the fence and I was standing on the other side of the fence and lying down in front of us was the number six, or uh, would you read it as six? I'll read it as, as six. The other person will probably read it as nine. And unfortunately, <laughs> Susan, uh, Stuart sings my song. Uh, wait till you hear my favorite song. <laughs> yeah, so Ian, somatic therapy is, is similar to this. And what I find is that if you embody the client, I wonder what will happen. If you embody the experience of the client, their pains, their troubles, and you can feel it viscerally in your body and you can paint a picture of what that looks like and how a product, a service, whatever it might be, could alleviate them from this. They will probably think you're reading their mind, right? Ter terrain tele telepathy, right? That's what uh, Kenneth calls it. See, I've been doing my studies. <laughs> and uh, yeah, so um, very, very important for us to begin on a journey of looking at these parallels. I, I call them transformational metaphor. Transformation because we are constantly on a journey from point A to point B. Uh, metaphor because most of the time, whatever you're experiencing cannot be expressed in just plain words alone directly. They're usually expressed like, you know, I have a headache that, 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 is, uh, that feels like a nail through my skull. Although in that particular YouTube video, it's literal, okay? So uh, Kevin says, healing process. I, uh, have I been silencing a part of me? Uh, <laughs> yeah, this is awesome. Um, if you've been silencing a part of you, chances are it will end up shouting back just to get your attention, right? And yes, sometimes when you ignore others, uh, the very obvious thing is that there must be some kind of a pain. What is that? Can you address that? I know a lot of, uh, of us are uncomfortable with bad feelings, isn't it? So one of the things I've realized is I have to, especially when I'm working with my clients, and this might be the same for you as uh, copywriters and as business owners, if someone freaks out, the last thing you want to do is to lash back, right? As if um, shouting louder reduces the conflict. Right? It typically escalates the conflict, doesn't it? So what we... Uh, or at least I do in my coaching uh, trainings with, with the people who are with me, is I get them to be calm. They become the eye of the storm, right? They become present. They observe all the patterns, the frowning of the eyebrows, the, the, the tension of the facial muscles, the breathing rate, the pattern of gestures? Is it, is it a aggressive gesture? Is it a giving up gesture? What happens there? And now the coach or uh, counselor begins to observe more than is said in words alone. And that is where the magic begins, right? Because now you're making space for a language that isn't written. You're making space for a language that isn't written. You're enabling an individual to express using the language that's most accessible to them, typically in the body, right? Uh, so that's why they call it body language, isn't it? It is a language. You're supposed to read it. You're supposed to get connected with it. 
Okay. Um, from ages zero to seven, that's where we are primarily in a theta brainwave mode. And that's why uh, most kids will soak up whatever's around them. Um, not by choice, of course, by modeling. Yes. And most of us, we still need, and some of us may have forgotten what happened from ages zero to seven. I, I still remember moments where I was cast aside, you know, put in a corner, couldn't make friends, maybe by my own design, but I don't know. I wasn't conscious uh, or at least very much conscious at that point of time. So it must have been a pattern that grew with me over a period of time. Um, but now as an adult, I can go back and I can relook and restructure my perspective so that the future will be different. The future will be brighter. The future will be more expansive for me. So given all of this, uh, I hope that th this is giving you a little bit of uh, 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 at least a conceptual way of how I look at clarity. But you have to understand that clarity can be viewed in different ways by different people. I'm just giving you a, 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 an overall structure of what I do in order to gain my clarity. So I don't uh, hide from my pain anymore. My pain is a messenger so that it can inform me. So uh, this is an analogy, uh, it's a, a battle analogy. So you send out scouts to collect information. And when the scouts come back, they inform you about the, the way the enemy is arranging the, the troops and so on, right? But you don't send the same scout back to fight the battle for you. Right? So you can't act on the emotion that sent you the message. You have to act on the intent behind the message. So the messenger says, oh, they're they are on this knoll, uh, but there's another hill that's overlooking that knoll and we should attack from there. That's a recommendation. You hold the space for that part of your army, <laughs> your messengers, to listen to and to express whatever they need to express. And then now you can call upon whichever is the most appropriate general to lead your troops to take that knoll. Right? Um, so what would be your generals? Now we got to think about it slightly differently. The clarity of action comes from the clarity of state. So if you know that uh, anger was sending you a message that says, I don't like the way I was treated. I want justice. Okay. Why justice? Because justice will enable fairness. Why fairness? Because fairness brings me a sense of um, satisfaction, a form of satisfaction. So perhaps what we're missing is the, the general of your army should be satisfaction, right? To enact that the role to go out into the world with satisfaction embodied in you first. So <clears throat> if you get clear on how this actually works, uh, and um, one of the things that I mentioned in, in forming up uh, clarity of offers, for example, again, tracing your history, taking a look at all your ups and downs, and then asking yourself, what problem have I already overcome? And then step into that problem that you've overcome as if you are someone who's younger, who hasn't experienced that problem. And you you probably be able to articulate that much, much more clearly because you've gone come full circle. Now you're going to educate these people in terms of how you are going to be able to uh, overcome this uh, hurdle, right? So the, the, the clarity is to know that um, any negative state that you're in, let's say you've got writer's block and you're feeling procrastinate, uh, like procrastinating, um, talk to that procrastination. Is it telling you something? Because procrastinate, there, there could be a thousand and one different reasons why you procrastinate, right? Most people just go, ah, he's a procrastinator. But no, maybe you're just uh, unable to recharge your energies. You don't know your energy sources, right? Uh, and as a result, you just burn the candle on both ends and you forget that uh, as a human being, you do need some methods of recharge, not just quick snacks and you know uh, drinking beer and all that kind of stuff. Uh, on the other hand, procrastination could really be a question, <laughs> definitely not that hungry. Uh, the, the key could be that your environment is not supportive and you haven't developed the communication skills to win over your environment in the first place. Right, So there, there are many, many reasons why such negative states take place. What you do need is a format in order to make a proper and discerning um, assessment of the situation. So I present to you Byte Seed. I know it sounds a little bit cryptic, 
but somebody talks about UFOs here, so I shall talk about you biting a seed. So number one, we start off with the inner circle. of There are two concentric circles, and you can draw that. In the inner circle, think of four key points, starting with the letters S, E, E, D. And what you typically will do is you use it as a means of reflection or as a means of calibrating to a goal that you want to aim for. For example, if I were just doing my morning meditations, I'll think about my SEED, which stands for what's the sensations that are happening in my body? What's the, and if I locate a certain sense of discomfort, I'll address it, right? I'll hold a space for it and I'll, I'll ask what emotion is it? That's the second letter. The third letter, E, stands for energy. What kind of energy is it? What level of energy is it? If it's a negative energy, I want to ask, if I continue with this emotion, what's the likely decision I'm going to make? Sensation, emotion, energy, decision. And through this process of exploring what's going on inside of me, I can tell whether this is a good thing for the start of the day or a terrible thing for the start of the day, right? In which case, now I need to uh, shift it. But how do I shift it? First, I need to ask myself, given uh, what I need to do for the day, right? <clears throat> is this the kind of sensation I want to have? Is this the emotion I want to have? Is this the level of energy that I want to have? And are these the kinds of decisions I want to make? Typically, if it's a negative one, usually it's no. And your, your mind kind of knows that it's, it's not very helpful. So here's what you have to do in the, in the outer circle. Again, four key points with the letters B, I, T, and E. So the first question you have to ask is, what belief must I have in order for my day to go well or my copy to go well? or my goal to be accomplished? What belief must I have? Okay. Um, I stands for identity. Who should I be? Who should I be today, now, or what version of myself should I invoke in order for today to go well? The third one is what thoughts, what predominant thoughts should I have inside my head my self-talk, my inner dialogue, and so on. What thoughts should I carry that will support the day or my goal or my conversation, whatever it might be? Okay? And finally, E, the last E, what experiences have I ever had that show me that I have the beliefs, identity, and thoughts already at my disposal? Okay? So that's the formation of bite seed. I use it primarily as a discernment model because uh, unbeknownst to many people, uh, I, <clears throat> I am a God-fearer, but I also fear evil spirits. Uh, sometimes sometimes uh, some problems occur not just as a result of uh, man-made things, but non-man-made things, if you get what I'm saying. Okay. So uh, I, I prefer to discern my own energies because I've become very good at that. And sometimes the energies don't belong to me. So I say the door is that way. Bye-bye. Okay. And it's very, very helpful. It's very, very helpful. So sometimes it comes from someone else whom I made a connection with and I'm going like, ah, I'm still holding that. So I've got a so, sort of like a bond. Those of you who understand the function of quantum mechanics, right? Uh, the moment you, you spend a lot of time with somebody and that person appears to be like an, an energetic vampire, you formed that quantum connection. So they start going on a done, downhill energy trend, but you haven't discerned that and you were connected with them. So somewhere in the world, they're going negative in a spiral and you haven't disconnected from that relationship. So I, I like doing what some people call cord cutting. Cord cutting. Right? Just visualize that line and just, just cut it and just release before, especially before you go to sleep. There's so many people who experience these kinds of um, connections and it sometimes keeps your mind going right, uh, when it ought not to. So again, um, why 
the selection of beliefs and identity and thoughts and experiences. Because uh, Dr. Richard Bandler, my uh, trainer in neuro-linguistic programming and a very um, instrumental mentor of mine, he said a long time ago, you know, human beings are conditioned to feel bad for no good reason. So for us, we need to learn how to feel good for no good reason. <laughs> so so uh, he, he does say this, right? And, and I totally agree. Many of us don't have clarity because we spend all of our inner resources creating nonsense and, and crafting imaginary, and they might be true, but we spend so much energy and time crafting negative pictures uh, in our mental living room. So if you were an artist, would you take the grime, the dirt, the shit, you know, all the, you know, the guy who threw up last night, would you use all those material for your art piece in your living room or not? Sounds disgusting, right? But the truth is that if we had our way, we would use the most beautiful resources, the most intricate, most valuable gemstones to, to craft a, a wonderful tapestry of something that you could sit down and completely enjoy every single day, don't you think? So what is that? When you go inside of your head, are you managing your own states and are you crafting the vision of where you want to go that's non-negotiable, right? Uh, so you have to ask yourself, if this is the perfect vision of where I want to go, who am I? What must I believe in order to get there, right? So uh, I spoke to this, uh, this regional CEO guy, the one who was having this bad experience with his son, and I asked him to think because he started to get into this emotional um, visceral emotional experience and he started tearing and crying and it was it was hard to bear so so I, I, I did an intervention with him and I asked him uh, Mr. So-and-so could you just take in a deep breath let's go into a form of relaxation and I brought him through a guided relaxation process and then I asked him after he came out and he was a little bit better, uh, I asked him to list down three people whom he felt most supported him because the guilt came from a lack of support in the past because of how his grandpa and how his dad treated him. So he started to write down three. He said, okay, my wife, my um, best friend from work and some other friend from somewhere else. I said, that's interesting. He said, why? Was that interesting? And I said, do you notice that in that list of whom you wrote down, you didn't write down yourself? And he was kind of taken aback because it was that moment where he realized that the very thing that he was lacking, that he'd been craving from external attention, was actually a lack of self-compassion, self-love. And uh, when, when you don't have that, it's going to be very difficult to love anyone else, let alone your own son, if you think about it. So this is where uh, we went through a, a process of, of healing. And that's one of the reasons why he was able to then connect back with his son. So you could find within him the love that was lost.